So thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. As Mark said, I'm Ambrose Field. I'm head of the department in music, but I'm also a composer and a researcher. I'm really interested in how we can make innovations in areas of traditional artistic craft through the approach of using applied science and technology. So today, I'm going to explain how an exciting piece of cross-disciplinary research enabled the process of musical composition itself to be rethought in order to help obtain a better match between the written score on the page and the final sound of the performance that you hear as an audience member. This project is the culmination of work undertaken in collaboration with my colleagues, Dr. Jude Brereton and Dr. Helena Daffin from the Department of Electronics here at York. And it forms the pilot study for a collaborative European Culture Fund bid. I am also very grateful for the participation and the beautiful sound of the Ebor singers, which you'll hear later in this presentation. So our approach, importantly, doesn't attempt to bend science into art and make some horrible hybrid of data mapping. There are enough of those about already, I think. <laughs> um, but instead, we wanted to really treat both disciplines on their own merits and ask simply, what do we learn when ideas from one domain can inform the development of ideas in the other. So our aim is to permit musical composition that makes the very best use of the architectural acoustics of a building. And it's the building that it is designed for is the one that I'm interested in. And I'll explain the economics of this later, as it may appear somewhat counterintuitive today in the 21st century to be making music that just works in one place. But as you'll see, there are definite advantages from being a bespoke composer. So of course, composers have been constructing their music and they've been interested in where it's going to be performed for centuries. And this is a very natural thing for all musicians to be interested in. You may have experienced this personally too. If you sing in your shower, then you'll know that you sound absolutely amazing. <laughs> However, I'd like to think in doing so that you'd listened to that acoustic and that you've changed your approach to performance as a result of having that acoustic feedback. Imagine the same process in Notre Dame Cathedral. So it's just the same for composers. And of course, composers have adapted their work to buildings for a long time. And as we're looking at Notre Dame, I want to talk a little bit about Paratin, who worked in the late 12th and early 13th century. Paratin, I think, had a very acute oral knowledge of large acoustics. And his musical style <coughs> is arguably very well adapted to those environments. I'm going to sidestep, however, a somewhat thorny debate as to how long and where Peritan actually worked, because we simply don't know enough facts, and there's a lot of unresolved musicological controversy about that. But Peritan's knowledge came from working in a physical environment on a daily basis, not from any form of analysis. It is relatively inexact, as Peritan had no way of knowing other than by ear and trial and error how complex sets of acoustic interaction would result from the resonant characteristics of the spaces in which he was working. We can't even be sure about the depth to which he considered these parameters. So today, we have a problem. Nobody is in a musical venue to prepare for a concert for more than five minutes, it seems due to commercial constraints. Unlike Peritown, who might have worked for a long time, time is pressured now. Some interesting venues, such as St. Mary's pictured here, also do not even exist in the form that they were once constructed. Yet, 
promoters, performers, festivals, and heritage applications are all calling for methods by which music can be made to be more specific to the place in which it is performed. I took this commercial need as an artistic challenge. So what's the research process? So today, we can access very detailed acoustic measurements of a kind not previously available. Why not, I thought, take this data into account when a composition is actually made, rather than just the leave the acoustic to be some kind of after effect of a performance? The data I'm referring to is detailed and comes from three-dimensional impulse response measurements, which go beyond a simple measurement of reverb time in space. This technique can describe in three dimensions and over time how every possible frequency in that space decays. Knowing this information, I wanted to make music which acknowledges that particular acoustic signature and reflect it in my choices of harmony and voicing. I stress acknowledges because I'm not simply tempted to map the data from one domain onto another, as I said at the opening. That would be a sonification application. I want to write a musical piece. So I wanted to know if the information that I had could help me achieve clarity and an unusual sense of presence in a large space. So to find out if this actually worked at all, I conducted a preliminary investigation. A team from the Department of Electronics Audio Lab made high resolution measurements of York's historic Guildhall. And I used that data to inform and disrupt what is essentially a traditional compositional process. Let's listen to the result. The piece that you're going to hear was made for the DAFX conference here in York. It's called Architecture One, a blend of architecture and texture. Don't do this with titles, by the way, I've discovered. Um, it, it doesn't work on Google. Um, Google says, do you mean architecture? No. Um, so we'll have to change this at some point. But uh, here's Architecture One, and I hope you hear in this performance of the Ebor Singers um, singing this work, how the interaction of the acoustic works with the musical lines themselves. turned out to 
be a complex problem. There are many interdependencies <coughs> resulting from the net oral result of all of these individual musical lines and their interaction with the reverberant environment. So, in order to be able to cope with life as a composer and this complex situation, I produced a software tool which allows the real-time modeling and visualization of the acoustic effect of the musical notation that I am writing. Plenty of tools exist today that work in this way with recorded sound, <coughs> where you can apply the impulse response reverb of a space to a recording. But there are no tools which demonstrate the effect of a real space on notated music that has not been performed yet. My software does this. I wanted to make music for a venue, like St. Mary's, here on the screen in wireframe, which doesn't exist today. So, could I use this technique and contemporary music to rediscover what the past might have sounded like? Well, the music you've just heard, I had a model of a real space to go on. We used the Guildhall in York for a pilot study. But in the case of St. Mary's, no substantive building existed. Before I could tackle this problem, I needed to perform more research and concentrate this time on the effects of overlaying simulated acoustics with real ones and what consequences that operation might have for the composer. Again, work undertaken in conjunction with the Department of Electronics Audio Lab was extremely useful in this respect and in particular Stephen Oxenard's simulations of St. Mary's in the commercial architectural design package Odeon were pivotal in enabling our forward progress. Firstly, I made some smaller scale studies musically, stripping back all of the musical parameters to simple textures and highly controlled simulated environments. This time, I used a single flautist, avoiding the complications of singing for a minute, to test my assumptions and created a cycle of 20 small pieces where each piece is written specifically to interact with a different set of simulated acoustics. So here's a sort of case study. We recorded this and it had an artistic outcome of its own and we're fortunate to be able to release this on record label Sargasso and it's also available on iTunes. So here's some of the preliminary studies. <laughs> So although you could hear there, there were some very long reverberation times, the piece has a kind of clarity to it. Nothing gets muddied. You can hear the reverb and you can hear the flute playing with absolute clarity. Now, armed with this information and those practical studies, it was time to tackle a larger project. I wanted to create a piece that enabled the audience to be able to experience a venue that doesn't exist in the form that it once did, St. Mary's in York. Taking the acoustic modeling done by the Department of Electronics Audio Lab, working out the consequences <coughs> of that modeling for musical composition, mapping those consequences to my choices of harmony, line, and counterpoint was a large scale task. And if you attended European Research Night in September, You'll have heard this project in situ, where 
This time, <clears throat> we've expanded assistance from the Department of Physics, Professor Thomas Krauss and intern Lewis Thresh. We augmented today's reality of that space for the audience by performing bespoke music in the truly spectacular 11 second reverberation that we believe St. Mary's used to have. This piece, Architecture 2, I still haven't learned from the title thing, <laughs> uh, takes into account the detailed nuances that that space had. And in doing so, we can create curves and lines which hang clearly in the air of this enormous building. Here is what it sounded like.